Hello everyone and welcome to episode six, I think it is now, Pardo of Rugby Nation. I'm Sean Maloney, this is Ian Payton and Justin Harrison in the middle. Uh, we've got smiles on the dolls to get things rolling because we've just been going over Game of Thrones. We won't spoil anything, that's not what we're about, but can I just get an MVP from you guys from the Battle of Winterfell, which aired last night here in Australia. Well, I think the, the MVP but you, is but, pretty but, obvious. Yeah, but you can't give the MVP, really, can you? Because well, it's happened. It's who are we going to spoil it for? It's happened. People who are watching who aren't expecting spoilers in Game of Thrones. Well, I can give LVP. Okay. Oh, mate. Big unit. What's his name? Sam Tarley. Donut man. Yeah, Sam, yeah, yeah. Sam Tarley was well, a big the hound, off. and the hound, the hound had a bit of an off. Look, I think well. in, I think I think you could sum it up <laughs> as saying if it was a game, it's a Game of Thrones. Um, the good guys start. It looked, it looked grim early. Didn't it they? wasn't you know, great. They were up against it. All the territory and, and possession was. Uh, they were just was, getting was against on. them. But um, every start. Let's just run say me, that one. Run, <laughs> you know, run meters heavily there, against. There's, there's a field <laughs> goal right guys. at the end. It does them right that's in the right. eye. Yeah. <laughs> there's a good match winner. Uh, so that's Game of Thrones. This is our look back to Super Rugby across the weekend. And there was a lot of jostling on GOT last night. A lot of jostling across the ladder across the weekend as well. Uh, let's start with Waratahs v Sharks. Then we'll come back to the ramifications of these results on the other side. Tars v Sharks. We all tipped the Tars last week. We were so far off. Mm. Well, I mean, you, you uh, look to the to the red card for Jed Holloway, who's subsequently having three weeks off um, for the uh, elbow slash forearm to the face, uh, and then the yellow card subsequently for Jack Dempsey. Very key moments in the game. Obviously, I mean, look, it's almost impossible to win a game of rugby these days when you're down a man, down two men for a while. You're playing you're playing rugby league out there. Um, I guess the bigger question is, uh, let's assess fair. Red cards, you'd have to say yes, wouldn't you, Google? I mean, you just, even if it's, there's no such thing as back play anymore, right, about this. Mm. You can't deal with a bloke tugging your, your shirt uh, in back play anymore. There's no such thing. The bloke falls over, looks like he's dead. He's getting attended by the medics. And, of course, they're going to stop and watch the replay. Yeah, it looked the, like the he was playing for Real Madrid yeah, at that stage when he's crumb sausage on the ground. But, you know, I, I probably want to just throw up a curveball here. You know, I, I get it. I get why he got red carded, but... Let's talk about the effect that that had on, had on the game and the product that we're trying to build around here. So what about, you know, yellow, sure, and then we'll review it at the end of the game. If it warrants further sanctioning, mm. then you're going to sit out the next three. But let's not ruin the match immediately. There have been, um, I mean, this comes up every time there's a red card, isn't it? It's a proposal for an orange card, which is 20 minutes, which is all as you say, yellow card. That guy can't come back on, but he can be replaced from the bench. What about There's a pink card if you just overact the injury and yeah. just milk it for well, all it's worth? That could I work. Mean, That'd be right. That could work. Uh, um, so I guess the question, Shawnee, that I was getting to was, um, did the Waratahs win that game anyway? If it was 15 on 15? Oh, look, the Sharks weren't setting the world on fire and attack. Certainly they were playing what we knew they would. Round the corner, big, strong back row, big forward pack and, and reasonably mobile. But mm. they weren't that exciting in the back line. So I think it would have been a better chance to go down to the last five. A try, four points here, there. Mm. It could, could have gone each way, but there's no chance once, once the Sharks score pretty soon after the yellow card and red card are issued. I can't believe that's the same Sharks team that went down against the Reds a week before. They could not catch a ball at home. They and the Hague was at home as well. It's just Sharks have it's been such a bizarre. Mm. It's a it's a bizarre competition in terms of results and the way the teams are up one week, down the next. They are up. They get it's the first win in Sydney since two thousand. Really, it's that long? Yeah. yeah. I think it, I think it, you got to ask those questions about what would have happened. The Waratahs do at least because it informs their tour of Africa now. They've got the Bulls and the Lions who, um, you know, all the South African teams play differently, but they also play the same, if you know what I mean. So they've got to figure out if if they, um, if that strategy of um, running them around and turning them around would have tied the Sharks late and, and got those tries that you're talking about. And if, it, if they think that that would have worked, then they persist with that. If not, they've got to think about different ways because they got thoroughly out-muscled um, in, the, in the contact areas. Yeah, I thought, I thought, you know, Waratahs seemed to be persisting with this in-behind um, two flat runners or a flat runner and then in-behind all of the time. So they're, they're working very hard to get advantage line and then taking away some of that advantage by going in-behind all of the time. And you invite teams to rush you then in defence, which suits South African sides. They're very good at narrowing in on defence and shooting, shooting out of the line. 
probably thought, you know, a classic match where we probably needed, well, Waratahs needed to keep the ball uh, in the forward pack, earn the right to go wide and give Kirtley Bull, Adam Ashley Cooper, Bernard Foley some more time with the ball. There's a question, sorry, question yeah, without notice, good. We're seeing a lot of smothering defensive tactics now in world rugby, right? 14 men in the line, all 13 at least, um, spread right across the line, as you say, rush defence. What's a, what's a simple way for a team to counteract that? Like what, how do you, if, if that's really proving effective against you, you're a coach at half time, what do you do, what do you say to them? To, to get around that, to, to think of ways to, to break that defence down? Oh, look, it's not, I'm not a fan of kicking, so I'm not going to say turn them around with kicks because that, that's just not sustainable. Kicking is just a turnover in disguise most of the time. I, I feel like the, the perfect model was what the Reds executed in Kings Park, inside shoulder, uh, avoiding big contacts, taking off short yards around one, two and three at the breakdown getting that outside defensive line backpedalling, which is very difficult to then reset and come forward uh, at any great pace and certainly with any great organisation. So, you know, having been a forward, mm. it is absolutely um, warranted where the forward pack need to dominate, uh, dominate those contact areas. The breakdown needs to be controlled a lot better than the Waratahs did at the, uh, uh, in, during the game. Their back row, I thought, were reasonably ineffective. Michael Hooper was pretty disappointing. Jack Dempsey watched some of the game and probably had to th think about what he was offering. Mm. Uh, and, and Wells was, you know, unsighted except for his missed tackle under the post. It was a tough night for Tars fans in front of, uh, I'm, I think it was a disappointing crowd, 10,000 only out there to Bank West. If you're looking for a reason maybe why it was down, you had GWS against the Swans back at the SCG uh, the same night at the same time. Maybe that factored in, but what can be done better to turn that around? Is it just results driven or can you find another way, another avenue to hook fans in out in the west and get them to that venue to get behind the Tars. Yeah, I got mixed feelings on this. I mean, I don't think you can offer up other games as an excuse on the night. Um, having said that, Bulldogs got 6,000 at ANZ a couple of nights earlier and we don't read about it. You know, I think we, we, we are harsh markers on our own code, probably the harshest. You know, 10,000 for an A-League crowd, they'd be stoked. But um, it's still not good enough for a, a brand new venue like that. It was always going to be compared to the rugby league game played a couple of nights earlier and, and look it's a fantastic stadium I had the, the privilege to be there and have, have a watch of that game it's a fantastic stadium everything you hear about it is right you've got to get out and have a watch um, for mine probably if I if nailed it down the Waratahs don't spend enough time out there during the week they, they train in Daceyville and fair enough it's a nice contained location but you know I think for these sort of one-off occasions two off occasions Go spend a week out in the district, um, visiting, you know, junior clubs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, shaking people's hands, shopping malls, all that sort of. Thing. Build those connections one to one. Yeah, I think being being second off the off the rank for that match, curiosity was probably worth two or three thousand extra people mm. to the first game, the Big league time. game that yeah. was played. So it wasn't a, no longer a new venue, uh, you know. And I think, you know, if you look at the product that was put on the field, I think the fastest thing on the night was a beer line. So. You know, that's a bit of a concern. It, yeah, it wasn't, it was, I think that's, we put that down as a forgettable game on Saturday night. So the Tars go down, they've got a tough road home to the finals. A side that's sort of trending the other direction despite losing at the weekend. The Brumbies up against the Jags, called that one from Buenos Aires, from the, uh, the star uh, Amafutani, Jose Amafutani over there I in have downtown no idea BA. You, no idea if you pronounce that correctly. No one does. You, wow. just, you just hammer it <laughs> home right like you are Spanish and away you go. Uh, it, was a, it was a dog good gutsy performance from the Brumbies they had a couple of moments to win it in that second half and couldn't convert but the signs are there I think towards the back end of the year good yeah look I think the Brumbies are starting to understand how they need to play uh, and and what their model is certainly we saw some evidence of them returning to kick for the touchline set up some play with more and then release the backs when they they need to you know I thought what was impressive from the Hagwas was their defense intensity in defence and discipline to keep that shape. Most of the time when you're playing the European male, he'll lose lose his concentration after a while, you start getting some penalties. I thought they were very disciplined. And all the time I'm thinking, you know, the Brumbies are playing against the Argentinian national side, 
you know what? And where does that? I don't want to say not fair because you you got to play against the best to beat the best. But I just I just kind of question the advantage that, that gives the Hagwas. Well, it's also uh, it's the toughest road trip yeah. you can do, right? The, the the bounce from Australia to Africa uh, and then to Argentina. You're going around the world basically inside a fortnight. That's uh, crazy. And, and you know you could speak better um, on this, good, but the impact you know the cumulative impact of that travel i'm sure has to have a have a you know in the, in the es- second half and especially when you've you've crunched 250 tackles a week previous that they just mm. they just ran out of gas yeah. in attack made a couple of decisions that ordinarily they probably wouldn't have made uh but yeah, I, I don't know. Just just watching it and, and being dialed into it, I thought there were there was some encouraging signs there. And, and Tom Banks was one of them. He carried strongly. I think he ran for I don't know. It's skewed more heavily towards a fullback. He ran for over 150 metres in that game and looked good with those touches. Mm. It just shows they want to attack. You know, when a fullback knocks out those sorts of uh, metres, it means that they're looking to play some ball in hand, put a team under pressure with repetition of phases instead of kick and hope, uh, which is pleasing. How close do you reckon he is to... We've sent him in the Wallabies squad to maybe getting a match day spot. Well, we've heard Scott Johnson talk about uh, picking on performance and not experience. So, you know, that, that's, that, that messaging puts everyone uh, in, in the selection line and, and puts a lot of pressure on all of the provinces to start performing consistently week in, week out. I and mean, Tom Banks has certainly done enough in the, in the last three to four weeks to warrant a consideration around that table. Uh, is it genuine, though, like I mean, that it is the right thing to say. You have to say it, um, but you're going to put a guy with 35 tests in ahead of a guy with it without five, aren't you? You know what I mean? At a World Cup, I mean, th- this is what they talk about: building up um, experience in the Test arena, which you know you have to play to to um, to get bad. You know, you have to you have to be in that arena to to get good at it. Um, uh, is he is he a genuine chance? I think what we've seen in the past is that. He's dropped out of squads and out of match day 23s because they don't view him as a guy who can also play wing. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it, it is great to hear that form will trump all, but is, is it, you know, is it fair to Well, I think World Cup squads, you do, you can afford to have a World Cup squad that's got three or four players that are going to be your B team guys. They're going to play against Uruguay and Georgia mm. and give them give them that exposure. And, and if he's the second or third best fullback in the competition, from an Australian provincial point of view, he deserves to go. Well, he'll get another sh- chance to show his wares. Next up, the Brummies take on the Blues, who will come in fresh on the back of a bye week. Uh, Friday night, we've got the tar- not the Tars, we've got the Reds, who are a little further north than the Tars, up against the Sunwolves. Uh, <laughs> so the Reds, the bye last week, the Sunwolves held to zero. I can't remember a last time where a Super Rugby side was held to the donut. At home. Could argue that Sunwolves had a buy as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, did they show up? <laughs> no, they weren't a favourite. <laughs> Tony oh, Brown. Well. Dogs, they did apart. they make any tackles? So Tony good. Brown said they were lucky to get zero. And they was because they were so strong against the Canes a week previous, and then uh, it just fell in a hole against the Highlanders, who were pretty impressive. The Reds, though, they will come into this off the back of that win over in South Africa. The benefit of the bye week as well, surely. Well, I mean, you who say knows? surely. They lost last year by six against the Sunwolves in Tokyo, but surely. Well, the Tars lost to the Sunwolves. The Sunwolves are probably better tourists than they are mm. uh, home, home players, given that half their team's not from Japan anyway. probably suits, suits the model. They're visiting home. Um, I but, mean, this is the dangerous part of the Sunwolves, though, isn't it? Like yeah. They, they, they uh, will lose the ones they're expected to win, and then, you know, like they, they've got nothing to lose. They've come out and said, well, we're off. You know, we're just going to play in a barbarian style kind of. So. They'll drop last week. Is there any real impact of, of dropping a big game like that? No, they come away this week. Um, you know, again, nothing to lose. Play that barbarian style. Uh, Masseray was scores another four, and you can see this being you know, a real banana skin game for the Reds. For but if the Reds do win, they can go. If they win with the bonus point this week, and this is how nuts the ladder is at the current time, the Reds currently sit in 13th position on 18 points. If they win with the bonus point, they can bounce, obviously, to 23, and you've got the Waratahs there on 20, so they can leapfrog the Waratahs with a bonus point win if the Tars don't defeat the Bulls. It's nuts. Yeah, an opportunity sometimes presents you with two outcomes. You know, you fear the opportunity and you, it becomes intimidating, or you go get it. You know, and I, I think that the Red Squad have probably shown enough 
um, backbone and steel and identity on tour yeah. to understand what the opportunity that's in front of them and not be afraid of, uh, of trying to maintain their momentum heading into a match that they should win but not be distracted by the opposition, more the opportunity. Well, the opportunity for, for a lot of teams, apart from, say, the Crusaders and the Canes who are out ahead, is to start stringing some wins together. You, you will rocket yourself up the ladder very, very quickly. And, and you know, it's probably a broader discussion, but no teams have been able to show any consistency as far as um, success goes. I'll win one, lose one, win one, lose one. Uh, has, has, does that have the bottom, so besides the Crusaders and Hurricanes, does that mean everyone's got that much better? Yeah. Or have they dropped away and Hurricanes and Crusaders are the only two sides that are maintaining the sort of elite level that we expect from Well, Super just Rugby? staying with the Crusaders for a moment, yeah. if they rested another three last weekend in that demolition of the Lions, if they go full strength at home on a Saturday night, how many international teams do you think they trouble? Oh, plenty. Everyone except the All Blacks. There you go. <laughs> Which, there you go. Yeah. But, but like you sit there watching it and you go, these blokes at home under Robertson, like they were they were so polished again the other night. So they, they are the benchmark for the moment, the Canes breathing down their neck and trying to give pursuit to those blokes at the top are the Rebels who will take on the Canes this weekend in Wellington. Their last trip to the Cape Tin, not so good, 71-6, they went down. Tough night. Uh, yeah, the Rebels, um, you know, yet another team who, who actually have to, to um, assert whether they want to do anything in this um, season or not. Tough place to win, though. The Canes look like they're starting to roll again um, after a hiccup in Japan. Um, they do okay in New Zealand. I mean, they've only won two of 17. That sounds um, that, that doesn't sound right, but they beat the Blues in Auckland last year and almost beat the Highlanders, remember, in that um, last game. So um, Dave Vessels has um, crafted something a bit different from previous Rebels regimes. Is it enough to, to beat the, the Hurricanes? Uh, I'd say no. It's a tough, tough road trip. Yeah, I think the one thing, or the two things, you know, sport has no regard for history. So what's gone before isn't going to worry the athlete that's taking the field uh, uh, to, to play against the Hurricanes in the Rebels contingent. The thing that gives me confidence about the Rebels is I still believe they're the most complete and consistent uh, performing um, Australian provincial side at this stage in terms of the style week in, week out consistency, maybe not so much results, but the consistent way that they're trying to stick to the style of play. They've clearly prepared that way in the, in the pre-season. They've recruited accordingly to play that style of game. And it looks like that every week, the players know where they should be and how they should perform. Sometimes their best isn't good enough, but they're certainly looking like the Melbourne Rebels every week. One of the guys who killed it for the Canes last week. I know that you were definitely across at Google in at Fox. Uh, Pato, Geordie Barrett's first half performance against the Chiefs last weekend was just sublime. Some of the stuff he put together on the part was just, hang on a second. Yeah, I was six foot three. You know, he's a, he's a great athlete. And that's exactly what you want to see happen with your rotation policy and resting policy. The two Barretts and um, uh, Surveyor come back and are three genuine game leaders, genuine test players playing in a provincial game and looking like World Cup players. That's what you want to see from your rotation rest policy. But he's a, they're the sort of guys, Surveyor's in, included, that you actually... You, pop it on just to watch them play. They're that electric. The try that Savia scored as well was, you just go, hang on, how? In the wet, one end of the park to the other. You mentioned the Crusaders. The Hurricanes are the only other team who look in the same district when they're on. I mean, you, Dane Coles isn't even back in that team yet, so. Got Ricky Riccatelli there, yeah, one of the great names. Um, yeah, no, they're, they're very impressive. If you're thinking in terms of the Rebels, how to beat them, um, you know, we have seen games where, where um, they target Geordie Barrett, you know, and, and, and he can throw the odd wild intercept pass and drop the odd ball. It's not it's not um, frequent, but uh, he, he's certainly not on the same level as Bodie Barrett, I reckon. You know, like the consistency yeah. of Bowden is, is outstanding. But, um, yeah, the main thing about Geordie is that I didn't have him in my fantasy team and the bloke no, I played did. So. He would have put some big numbers up. So he's obviously a 15 with the Hurricanes uh, this week. A little flashback to a former 15 with the guys out of Wellington, a Christian Cullen, Cully. Now, he did go by the name. I can never get away. His hometown was Puka... The Puka, 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 no, Puka it was, no, no, it was way long of that. Express. Oh, really? And he was, wasn't he? You played against him. Cullen, against what him. planet was he from?
He's come on. Bit of room here. He's through. What a bust here by Christian Cullen. Plenty of support, and what a dummy! Absolutely magnificent length of the field stuff. Oh, it's one of those players where you you found yourself in the heat of the battle, stopping and actually watching him play while you were playing. And you know, I think he ran past me twice every time he touched the ball. And you know, one of the policies was not to kick the ball to him, which yeah. just wasn't a problem for me. I wasn't allowed to kick anyway. But whenever someone did kick the ball and it would go to Christian Cullen, you know, 60 on his 22 try line, I'd just go and stand at halfway and wait for the conversion <laughs> to happen because I just knew he was going to beat everyone. I was more used to the team by just getting out of the way. You jog back to uh, underneath your black dot yeah, and just, just go wait. right. Well, I'm just, trying to just I'll head stand for the here. water bottle straight away. Yeah. Now's my chance. But do you, do you get a sense? I mean, we we talk about these guys rightly as you know legends of the game now. But did you get a sense when you were playing just how good? Uh, a guy like Christian Cullen was. Yeah, you did. You did. You absolutely. You could. You you knew that this bloke was performing at a level that was a way above anything that you could hope to match, and and that he was a talisman for the team. And particularly when all of the language and a lot of the rhetoric leading leading into games was centred around how to try and play those blokes out of the game. You yeah. understood if you could stifle some of their performance, you were some way to matching what was going to come at you on the mm. night. So Christian Cullen, obviously a All Black great, and uh, the Junior All Blacks have been going around across the weekend in the Oceania Championship. So to have the Junior Wallabies guys and a number of guys fronted up and went really well in the green and gold across the weekend. Fraser McWright, Will Harris, who's particularly handy, love watching him do his thing. Harry Wilson, excellent also as the big guys, uh, Essie Hangana and Trevor Jose. Things looking good for the 20s. Yeah, look, they're not a team that's got um, a bucket load of super rugby stars this year, but um, gee, they, they looked impressive um, in that win over Japan and had another game against uh, Fiji. Um, to play at the time of us filming this. Um, just They look like a really good, strong, solid unit, and, and I think that's the benefit of the, the changes to the system. This is a team that was picked out of the under-19s tournament at the end of last year. They've done a lot more camps. It used to be like they were thrown together for three days and then sent off to, to battle. But, um, yeah, look, an impressive side, and, and I'll be interested to see how they go against that junior All Blacks team um, later in the tournament. And I'll get another swing at them at the World Cup over in Argentina, Argentina, a little bit later this year. That'll be good to watch as well as. Uh, and then on the home front, we've obviously got our Sydney Shoot Shield and Brisbane Club competition in full swing at the moment. Big upset at the weekend with Eastwood, bouncing oh, I uni. Even, I can't even do that anymore. I was going what to try and do a w, the Woodies. W. The Woodies. That hand I just cramped. I forget then. that you played with the Woodies. Yeah, they do too. They try to. <laughs> <laughs> Out in Mudgee, they yeah. were too strong. They held on against Uni. Looking great. Um, they've got Taylor Adams running the show for them at 10 there. Bro. Just, uh, West from with West Harbour. Medalist. Catch Pearl Medalist. Also with the Rebels for the Rebels for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, and some, and done some very good recruiting in the off-season. Ben Batcher is now the coach up there. So they're looking pretty Benny? good. He would have been your opinion. I did play with yeah, Benny Batcher. Benny. Benny and Nick, brothers. Grease lightning for the uh, drink vouchers after the game. Was he, he? That's the quickest I ever saw him move. BB. Uh, Norse, they were too good for Manly at the weekend. Rats, too good for Gordon. Uh, Darren Coleman's return home, not a winning one to the Rats, formerly coach at uh, Ringer. And the other game saw was the curtain raiser for the Tars game, Western Sydney 2 Blues. Western Sydney 2 Blues. Yeah, Western Sydney 2 Blues, formerly Parramatta. Uh, West Harbour West Harbour got the job done the uh, over them. Up up north, um, brothers are running rampant in the Brisbane comp, okay. um, leading up there, um, playing very strongly. UQ uh, have dropped two in a row now. Um, uh, so, yeah, lots to, lots to like about club footy, Sean. Lots to like through the 20s. Lots to like through Super Rugby as well. Lots to like about your guys' performance. We're going to wrap it up here for another episode of Rugby Nation. We've got more Game of Thrones to talk, which will keep us kicking till this time next week. We'll catch Aria. You. Aria killed the night. <laughs> Look out for the drop goal. <laughs> <laughs>